Ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome. Uh, it's my real pleasure to be able to welcome you here today to this seventh microfinance lunch break here in Brussels. Uh, for me, it's actually the second time that I have the honor of introducing a distinguished speaker here. Uh, and, uh, but it's actually the first time that I speak to you uh, in this uh, forum uh, after I have had an practical, uh, real-life experience of microfinance. Indeed, uh, I was uh, with a BRS uh, and KBC delegation in Rwanda for a few weeks ago, and for me that was a, a real inspiring experience, and I just wanted to share that with you. I mean, uh, before, microfinance was for me an intellectually attractive and, 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 and convincing uh, com concept. Uh, now I really saw it with, its, uh, with a number of real success stories, with some more difficult um, experiences, uh, saw some of the pitfalls, uh, but uh, I saw especially and above all uh, that it can actually change uh, some people's lives uh, for, for the better and that it's uh, a concept that uh, actually can really work and, and deliver. And so for me that was a, a very... Uh, very moving experience in, in, in a way. So I just wanted uh, to share that with you and, and, and thank my colleagues at uh, uh, BRS, SERA and KBC for, for, for organizing such a trip. But so today we will uh, focus more specifically on uh, microinsurance and about microinsurance approaches that uh, reach the poor. There are an increasing number of um, clever risk coping mechanisms that protect poor people in developing countries from risks they face. Uh, still, even the most innovative microinsurance product is worthless without an effective distribution mechanism. We are therefore very grateful uh, that Matthew Brandon, uh, Brandon Matthew, sorry, is with us um, to enlighten us on this important uh, characteristic of successful microinsurance programs. Uh, Brandon Matthew started his career, uh, a career at General Motors Europe in Germany in a finance and service role. He was then hired by American International Group to turn around an affinity insurance program which was losing the company uh, apparently uh, money across the world. In doing the turnaround, he started to uh, and led acquisitions of companies in Asia, in Europe and Latin America. Businesses which Brandon started during the late 1990s in Brazil, Jamaica, Mexico, and others were to become, within 10 years, uh, the largest generators of revenue and profit for AIG in Latin America. So really impressive performance. These businesses have, uh, found a formula to distribute low-cost insurance to low-income customers. Almost immediately, Brandon was fascinated by the, by the idea of profitable business that would uh, at the same time do some real good for customers and he became committed to extending and improving the formula. He championed microinsurance within AIG, initiating its cattle insurance program in India, which uh, was even featured on the cover of the Wall Street Journal. Uh, it was then that he was attracted by Zurich Insurance Company to lead its group-level initiative and public-private partnership with the Swiss Agency for Development and Cooperation for Microinsurance. At Zurich, Brandon oversaw development of innovative products, services, and distribution techniques throughout pilots and by working with the field operations in Africa, Asia, and Latin America. In addition, he led the company's efforts to partner with the other future-looking organizations, such as the Microinsurance uh, micro Network, IAIS, ADA, and BRS, and, and many others. We uh, welcome Brandon here today, just as he has founded a new company, StoneStep GmbH, where he continues his work to expand the frontiers of microinsurance. He continues as an advisor to Zurich and also on the board of directors of the Microinsurance Network and the steering committee of the ILO Microinsurance Innovation Facility. Brandon facilitates the network's distribution working group and is therefore one of the best placed persons of the microinsurance sector to provide us some insight in microinsurance distribution approaches that reach the poor. So we are most interested, Brandon, to hear from you and from your wide experience. Thank you.
Good. Thank you very much for that uh, very kind introduction. Uh, I am delighted to be here today. Um, uh, and I'm very grateful for the invitation from BRS, uh, from ADA, of course, and KBC. And as the topic we're going to speak about today is distribution of insurance to poor people, I think it probably is appropriate to start with should insurance be sold to poor people? What, what is the purpose of insurance in the life of the poor or of the working poor or of the lower middle class? And to do that, I'll start with a slide that I've actually borrowed from a, a prior uh, talk that was given here by Jonathan Mordock when he spoke about portfolios of the poor. And in that talk, he described uh, Faisal here uh, with a household monthly income of $36, a very low income, who had broken his leg. But without insurance, this meant that he delayed treatment, he lost eight months of wages, and the cost of this, the cost of fixing the leg, though $250, required that he take out a loan from a microlender, that he dipped into savings, that he had an advance from his, his son's employer, and that he called upon relatives. And so the importance of insurance, if we think about this for a $250 broken leg, a broken leg is a, 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 not some sort of an extraordinary event, it's unusual, hopefully, but uh, it, it happens. If the requirement is a longer hospitalization, or if it's the loss of the working assets, or any of a number of things, this can really, really impact the life of a low-income family and a family that is working to come out of poverty. So, we first think about this benefit of insurance being there when an event occurs. That first, that first use of insurance is this idea when Faisal breaks his leg that it's going to be fixed. But there are actually three benefits that I'd like to call your attention to. Being there when it matters for a claim. That improves the resilience when these occur events occur. The second one is super critical. In fact, perhaps uh, the most critical in a way, improving the ability to make investments. The person who is able to take their risk and transfer it to someone else for a small premium relative to the amount they'd need for the event is then better able to use the rest of their money to do more interesting things. And this is how every large corporation works. This is how all of we all work. We don't save for these insurable events. The corner store on your street carries a larger inventory because it knows that should there be a fire, their inventory can be replaced. And if they were not able to insure that inventory, they would carry a smaller inventory because the risk, the severity of these infrequent events would discourage them. The third benefit is the funds create these societal assets, and we can talk about this in terms of the long-term matching of, uh, uh, or of mobilization of savings towards you know, longer-term infrastructure projects, but I like to think about this one in terms of the doctors that were there to fix Faisal's leg, that without having some security that they will be paid, it's very difficult for somebody who's paid for medical school and needs to have their own equipment to go and work in a low-income neighborhood. So the societal assets that come through this, this guarantee mechanism of sorts, this ability, this strengthening of the community's ability to pay for these infrequent events, creates new societal assets. And despite these, you know, rather almost remarkable uh, benefits that can come from the product, it's not exactly what everybody gets excited about buying. Um, now, I, I, as an aside, I'll recommend if you, if you want to search for such an image on the internet, there's a big difference between disgusted, which she is, and disgusting, which you don't want to see. So on the customer side, there's a bit of discomfort, perhaps, or it's an unusual transaction, thinking about future loss events. Nobody wants to think about these bad things that can happen in the future. And then on the other side of the equation, for the insurers that are going to sell insurance, the places where low-income people buy are quite different than where they're accustomed to working or where we're accustomed to working. I mean, if you look here, of course, the fellow in, the, in this uh, upper left-hand corner is 
he's a typical insurance agent, uh, a, a bastion of the community, and a, a guy that will sit and work through with a family for some hours what, uh, what exactly their needs are. But low-income people are buying in supermarkets, and you can hardly tell what that picture next to him is. That's shelves and shelves and shelves of products and how to stand out in that sort of an environment. Or below, in a village where an agent is visiting and speaking with people who are unfamiliar with uh, the concepts of a long-term contract. Uh, or over beside that, uh, we have a lottery ticket window in Brazil, where uh, a lot of insurance is then bundled, in fact, with lottery tickets, which uh, I'll mention later. So we have the supply side here, where insurers are perhaps not so familiar with, uh, these distribution methods, and the demand side, where customers are also not so accustomed to buying the products. That makes for a difficult distribution relationship. So I'm going to speak about four different areas that are then important to understanding this distribution relationship. And the first one is because many of us, I think uh, probably all of you here in the room today, are familiar with microcredit enough that you came to hear about uh, this, this, this uh, uh, pro-poor engagement, this ability to actually do sustainable business. But it's important to know that microinsurance is different in a lot of ways from microcredit. First of all, uh, in order to sell a commercially viable policy, one that makes even a small return, the smallest return, it requires that the customer have assets and income. Uh, I'll say that you know, all of my, you know, maybe not all of my customers have assets, uh, but all of them are, are alive and have some sort of an income to insure, because that's, that's important. Without that, of course, customers need charity, deserve charity, uh, deserve philanthropy, deserve outreach, deserve social security that can perhaps be provided by government. But we're talking about a segment where we want to actually be able to sell insurance and make that insurance work for the poor and also be sustainable over the longer term. And that's different than giving credit. Now, unlike credit, in an insurance transaction, the customer needs to trust the company. With a... Um, uh, with a credit transaction, the company gives money to the customer and the customer repays it. In this case, the customer gives the company the money first, and this requires a completely different trust transaction. The premiums that we're talking about are actually smaller than the loans, or in fact, much smaller than the loans. Uh, I checked on the mixed market, uh, and in South Asia, the average loan is about $155. And in, um, in Latin America, it's more like uh, 1,000, a little bit above $1,000. And, and most in between tend towards the Latin American number, 400, 600, 800, in, in, in terms of the loan size. Now, 10% as an APR would be an extremely, that would be a great APR for a microloan to only ask 10% of these loans. Yet, Microinsurance products do tend to be only that 10% of what a microloan would be. And that is, is in order to also include not just the operational expenses, but also the claims expenses. So it is a very challenging product in terms of the operational efficiencies that are, are going to be required. And lastly, another difference is that whereas credit very quickly finds eager uh, consumers in the middle class, people who are looking to buy a refrigerator, a washing machine, a moped, a what have you. Um, insurance has not penetrated into the middle class as quickly. And uh, this shows out in the numbers. The per capita insurance premiums of the industry in developed markets is about $3,600 per capita. And in emerging markets, it's about $89. And this indicates a much lower penetration, of course, of insurance in, in those markets for the middle class, lower middle class, and the poor. Who are we talking about? We'll start with up here. You have a picture of me with uh, Lady Bernice, who I met in Soweto. Uh, we went and first picked her up at her, at her place of work which was sandwiched in between here, this folding table where somebody was selling sort of candies out on, uh, on a folding table. And, and down here below, you have somebody selling sheep. Those were the two businesses closest by to her and closest to her house. 
Um, she herself actually taught taxi drivers, aspiring taxi drivers, how to drive. And we went back to her house to talk about burial insurance, which is a, a, a burial societies are a very common uh, um, uh, feature of African society, whereby a group of people will gather together and pay in regularly uh, in case one of the members should die, and then they'll pay for the burial. And when we went to her house, I was really... It was remarkable, the assets that, that I saw there. I mean, a, a colleague later remarked, oh, Soweto, it's like the Park Avenue of townships. And I said, well, it's maybe, but it's still no Park Avenue. She had three color TVs, a computer. She had uh, all sorts of, 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 you know, fairly expensive furniture. She was a pretty strong consumer, and yet she didn't have insurance. And the burial society that she was using the benefit that it had was one quarter what the insurer would be able to provide. In fact, you know, with, I was working with Zurich, what Zurich could provide to her would be four times more valuable. But it wasn't valuable to her because she didn't trust it yet. And in fact, it wasn't available to her. So this is a key of distribution, is how are we going to make it available and how are we going to earn the trust of the customers that we mean to serve? Because getting to large numbers is key. Uh, anyone who tries to do a business, of course, knows that if you only sell one, uh, you're probably not going to cover your expenses so well, uh, certainly not in a consumer product such as this. So in order to uh, uh, cover the cost, one needs to sell a good number of policies. But in insurance, there's an additional requirement because one needs also to prevent against anti-selection. If the only customers that buy the product are the ones that are most likely to claim, then the product, of course, can't work. One needs to have a large group that buys the policies and a, a, the proportional number of the population who would normally have that event claim against the policies. Another very important one for microinsurance in particular is this community learning, because Insurance is abstract. It's a long-term contract, a year, maybe two, five years. But unless somebody in the community has a claim and has that claim paid, it's, very, it's, 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 it's an abstraction. Uh, and so if sufficient numbers aren't reached in order for the, uh, the community to see claims being paid, then this is going to be a problem. So there are two basic options uh, that, that we see in order to sell insurance to low-income people. Uh, there's the embedding insurance as a feature of another product, and another is the sale of optional individual products, which is much more what you may be familiar with. So to show some examples, on your left, we'll start in the upper corner, you have a fertilizer bag. And this uh, IFCO sells fertilizer in India and intended to differentiate its product against another product. And so if one bought five bags of their fertilizer, the customer then received an accident policy, which means that if they broke an arm or a leg or what have you, there would be an insurance payment. Arms and legs are very important to farmers. This was meant to make the fertilizer more attractive, even though it isn't such a close connection between the two products. Another one is uh, with credit linked. There are a number of different credit linked uh, policies. One that was particularly interesting to us was where um, customers stop paying back their credit we worked with the company to add a funeral cover for anyone who brought their outstanding debt to within 30 days, they would receive that cover for free. And we expected that maybe people who were 90 days over would, would come back, but in fact, we had people who were a full year out coming back because this need, this desire for insurance was so strong. Below that, we have something that's been sponsored by Credit Suisse, uh, and it's a, a lease-to-own program on cows and, and milking machines and so forth. And fundam fundamental to the proposition to these farmers is the idea that while you're paying into the product that, 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 or paying into the asset, it's going to be protected. And this is very, very critical because as people are taking a risk in buying a new asset, they want to be sure that that asset is going to continue. So with Embedded, it's very much about encouraging people to adapt, adapt behaviors, and, and, and to uh, see products in a new light. Over on this side, we have sort of flashier uh, things because these are products that are being sold. At the top, you have Casas Bahia, which if you're familiar with CK Prahalad's 
fortune at the bottom of the pyramid. He does a long case study on them because they are absolutely a behemoth uh, a retailer of electronic goods and furniture. But as you can see here, their, their mascot, this Bayano, uh, he's also selling uh, dental insurance. And in fact, they have a full slate of insurance covering all sorts of, uh, all sorts of risks, and it's extremely successful financially. Below is a program that has just been launched by Allianz, together with MTN, selling via mobile phone. Obviously, with the ubiquity of mobile phones uh, and the ease with which one can do a financial transaction, this is becoming a very popular method as well. So, while achieving big numbers is important, achieving those numbers in the right way is critical. Because good sales, and by good sales, I mean sales where the customer knows that they made the purchase, that they know that the insurance is there, good sales benefit everyone. Earlier in the presentation, I spoke about, first we have that being there benefit. We have the service formation benefit, this thing where now Faisal's doctor is ready to help him in his neighborhood. And I said, perhaps the most important is this allowing greater investment benefit. Well, because of the, the feeling of the transfer of risk. If you don't know that you bought a policy, then there's no way for you to get that benefit. If, if, if the policy was somehow obscured through very uh, uh, labyrinthine policy wording, you're not going to feel that you've actually transferred the risk. And so in order for the risk to transfer, in order for this very important benefit to be achieved, it's critical. Um, to, uh, 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 to do good sales. Overpromising creates many problems. Of course, we see this in all financial products, uh, but certainly in insurance, because it is this trust transaction for the customer where, where that's violated. The customer will go back and tell many of their, their friends and neighbors about uh, their experience with insurance. This is costly to the insurer in the first instance because, of course, it goes, uh, the claim is made, which incurs a cost. Then the, um, uh, the claim will be contested with a, uh, you know, a consumer court, potentially. And, of course, future sales are harmed because the, the, the image of the entire product, this, this critical trust element, uh, is violated. And in selling well, we have to also consider that in a supermarket, the person that's stocking the shelves is probably not going to be that much better educated on the products or more familiar on the products than, than the person that's, that's buying them. And so there are a number of levers that are used that need to be used in uh, very careful and specific ways. So sales incentives, of course, have to be proportional, uh, but have to recognize that uh, the sale needs to be made. Literature and product design, as well as training and measurement. I mean, training and measurement are not just good tools, they're essential tools. Putting this into the framework of the organization, making sure that the measures that, are, uh, that, that encourage the sale of insurance are clear and consistent and uh, uh, available for the people on the shop floor as well as in the management room, and that they're aligned are, are fundamental. I worked with a major retailer in Mexico uh, where they only had two big measures. They wanted to see how quickly customers got through the checkout line and how quickly the turnover in the back office, or sorry, in the, in the warehouse went through. They wanted to turn over their inventory. Well, insurance was terrible on both of these measures. It did nothing but slow down the cash register line and it had no inventory. What we did to alleviate this at least somewhat, and it did help sales uh, quite a lot, was to create an inventory because at least then the manager had to say, wait a minute, I'm receiving 100 shipment of these policies. I'm going to have to figure out, each month, I'm going to have to figure out how to uh, uh, integrate this better into my, uh, my sales program. So some examples again. This comes from Bradesco in, uh, in Brazil. In designing their product and their literature, they actually had an anthropologist live in the favelas for six weeks to understand what customers wanted, to understand what they would react to. It's very clear. You don't have to speak Portuguese to understand what this says. Uh, you know, how do you protect yourself against rain? Well, you go and buy a raincoat. The rest of the, the catalog is, is exactly as clear. And unlike a lot of the literature that you might see from uh, in, in a bank in New York or in wherever, where it's, it's showing stability through dark blues and greens and it's very stately. 
uh, here in, with this population, you tend to see pictures of people. You want to see smiling faces. You want it to be aspirational also. Everybody wants to aspire to a better life. So it's not a picture of somebody uh, that looks like they're straight out of a, a favela. He's wearing a suit. She's, she's you know, a, an attractive lady. It's a wonderful looking family. People aspire to a better life. And financial services products, um, when presented in that way, it's a form of respect to the customer, saying that we understand that that's what you are aspiring to. Here is a a pilot uh, experiment that we did at Zurich, which was to use mobile phones where the presentation would be made on a smartphone by a, a mobile agent, a, a sort of formerly unemployed uh, person who would go to the taxi ranks and walk through the, the neighborhoods of the townships. And in order to get to the actual sale, it required that the, uh, the agent explain all of the terms and conditions and check boxes to say that they'd done all the terms and conditions and only then could they register the sale. Ensuring that it was more difficult for the agent to missell than it was for them to sell. Um, and mobile phones, of course, hold a lot of very interesting benefits where we need to know where an asset is, let's say a hut in a place where there's no street address, GPS uh, using the camera feature are, of course, uh, very exciting opportunities. Down below, another way that, uh, uh, of course, you'll all be familiar with is, is through mutuality, another way of in, uh, creating this trust and making sure that the sale is good. This is a picture from Uplift, which is um, a, a real pioneering Indian uh, uh, insurance mutual. They've managed to build a customer base of 100,000, which is, is very big for uh, this manner of distribution in India. And it's because they, they see sales not just as that distribution event that first time, but that the entire relationship is about creating a long-term relationship. So the post sales, the, the, the interaction uh, is, is what they, they aim for. So it's not a one-time event, it's something that extends through the lifetime. And they find the benefit through retention because the retention ratio of this mutual and of others is extremely high. Uh, and as an underwriter, I can tell you that uh, a high retention ratio is very strongly correlated to profitability because you're keeping the customers that you want. You're not having a churn of customers that are having a lot of difficulty finding insurance elsewhere. So with individual sales, uh, no presentation on insurance can... Uh, 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 should avoid this. It's uh, the cost in the individual sales because the policies are so low cost, even the price of paper can, can affect the percentage, right? A, a, a 50 cent piece of paper means nothing in a $1,000 auto policy, but it is meaningful in a $10 policy. And not only that, but actually selling a policy to a person does require a salesperson or the product has to sell itself. So one way that's being used in Brazil for products to sell themselves is this lottery component. It is, uh, uh, it's called a capitalization product, whereby half of the total uh, policy cost is a, a, a lottery ticket, essentially, and the other half, within the other half, are the commissions for the sales agent, the, the you know, claims reserves, the operational cost, et cetera, et cetera. The thought behind this, because it's very successful, people buy a lot of these. Um, the thought behind this is that it's teaching people about risk. It's teaching people about insurable risk and future. The question about it is, is it just teaching people about lottery? I mean, certainly it's a, it's a fair question, but I think at this stage of development, we really are trying to learn from as many of the things that are working and trying to distill those things that are working understand them and then make them better wherever possible, rather than closing our eyes to things that are working uh, because we don't like them at the, at the initial instant. So I already mentioned that uh, with the teeny premiums, every element of the transaction is a big cost. And then the over-reliance on sales commission is something that always needs to be watched out for. Um, we've seen this certainly in the US and the UK and other markets where you have um, salespeople that are overly ambitious only for the commission, uh, this does, does drive mis-selling. I, I once had my photograph taken congratulating a person who had had a 102% uh, penetration 
ratio. So for, for 100 customers, he'd sold them 102 policies. And this, of course, was absolutely ludicrous. But the way we designed the campaign, I had to shake his hand and say congratulations. But it meant that he sold at least two people policies that they didn't need. Uh, and this was very discomforting to me. And one of the things that made me say, wait, we should move into microinsurance and maybe not uh, just think about this as insurance. So I'll, I'll start to conclude here. It's some of the important areas to watch, some of the, 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 the biggest developments. I've already mentioned mobile phones with six billion of these things on the planet and their ability to tie people together. It's not only in the ability to sell, but it's also in the ability to understand the customers. Signify uh, is a, uh, a startup that's operating in Latin America where they use the, the data out of both postpaid plans, so the monthly plans, and also prepaid, the cards that one might buy at a, uh, at a kiosk or something, in order to know what the, um, the customer's risk profile is. And in a country like Brazil, where the number of customers that have a thick credit report is very small, most of the population doesn't have any credit report, but they do have a cell phone, the ability to find a risk score that is ac as accurate as uh, the credit score is wonderful. And in fact, the early Signify data that they've done in banking is that they have better understanding of the customers through the mobile phone data, where the people are moving through the day, antenna to antenna, um, how much they're topping up uh, their cards with, so on and so forth. Microinsure is, uh, has been funded by the Gates Foundation uh, and has opened up in Africa and Asia, a number of different things, but has really found a specialization. They're, sorry, they're like a, a broker agent for microinsurance. They've specialized now in uh, selling, via the mobile phone, life insurance policies. And in Ghana, during their first six months of operation, they doubled the size of the Ghanaian life insurance market. And it isn't that the Ghanaian life insurance market wasn't trying. There was 20 insurers or something. It had been around for, regulated for 75 years. They came in and it was because they were selling policies for pennies to people that really wanted to buy them via mobile phones. The next one is these actions within global corporates. So I spoke about the embedded insurance and, and how this can create a richer proposition. Well, Large corporations are understanding this as they are more active in emerging markets, as they see the vulnerability of their uh, employees and suppliers to insurable risk, and they want people to adapt. Places like Roche, you can say, well, are the research and development costs too high? That's something that sometimes people ask about pharmaceuticals. Or is it the fact that people can't collect together and be ready to pay. I don't know how many of you would be ready to pay the sixty dollars to $80,000 for a course of chemotherapy. I mean, it's, it's a lot of money to come up with at once. And certainly in a low-income environment or for a lower middle-class family, it's more than a challenge. It's an impossible challenge. Um, Syngenta and other grain makers can make a grain that is pest-resistant, but that may not be drought-resistant but with a rainfall index product, which says that during the growing season, if the rain is below or, or far too much above what is needed for the plant, that there will be a payout, all of a sudden this grain is not just pest resistant, but it's pest and drought and flood resistant. Nestle, it has its truck drivers, it has its distributors, it has the people that it buys milk from, it has the people that it buys cocoa from, all of these people are working with their two hands and legs and, and are critical to their supply chain. And insurance can make them more stable and better able to work with Nestle. And Walmart, in my home country of the US, is doing any number of very interesting uh, experiments, including health clinics at the sites of their stores, where we've had a, a problem with health insurance for some time. Another big area to look at is this tangible product bundling. So taking this out of the ether, not making it a long-term contract that people don't fully understand, and making something more immediate. We have uh, this, this Zurich card that we've used in Mexico, which offers a pharmacy discount immediately. So the buyer uh, that has it can get a 10% discount on, on things at a pharmacy, plus some other immediate benefits. Or this little, uh, this little bolsa, this bag that we were using in, in Bolivia to sell 
uh, insurance at newsstands gives an immediacy to the product because it includes some both valuable information and it has the bag and it has some other things. So it's making things more tangible so that the customer can feel it and touch it and understand it right away. And last and certainly not least is the activity of regulators who have in some way been ahead of the industry. Uh, India coming up with regulations some years ago, but also more recently the G20, uh, uh, including microinsurance specifically and its financial inclusion statements starting back in uh, Pittsburgh some years ago, and the IAIS, which is the International Association of Insurance Supervisors, which were delighted at the microinsurance network, were delighted to have seen that just last week they approved an application paper, so an additional paper, to help interpret their insurance core principles. The IAIS is the standard setting body for insurance. So this is pretty, you know, uh, uh, a serious group of people, and they're saying the insurance core principles need this application paper because this is a pretty serious issue that we're trying to address, or a very serious issue that we're trying to address. How are we going to make sure that insurance reaches the people that need it most, but who are receiving it the least? So, for my last slide, I'll say, and I, I always like this picture of this guy, because it, the picture that you see, this is called the Q drum. And it was designed in order to make it easier to move potable water across long distances, because the traditional way is in gas cans or a tub on one's head, and those aren't that easy for a 10-year-old boy to pull across a couple of miles. And I think this is a good example, though, of the fact that we don't actually need to reinvent the wheel. So in insurance's case, underwriting, the capital that's there in the industry, uh, actuarial profession, we don't need to reinvent those things, but we do need to rethink them, and we do need to think about that last mile and what it really is like in the situation on the ground in order for us to bring this demand, this real demand and want of low-income people together with the supply that exists in this $3.5 trillion industry, um, bringing these two together through distribution, bringing them together also through better service and claims, is really, I truly believe, uh, very important for, for everyone, for industry, and certainly for the low-income populations that we aim to serve. So with that, I'll end my prepared comments and look forward to our conversation. Hi, uh, my name is uh, Nicolas Prochet from uh, Funds for Good. Um, what are the, in the institutions or insurance companies that uh, create those products? Are they the same as the microfinance institutions that give loans to people? Um, so, the insurers that are creating them span from the multinationals down to local insurers. The distribution channels that are providing them to customers, uh, microfinance institutions are critical because they are focused, of course, on this segment and they're focused on doing uh, the right advised sale for the segment. But mobile phone, supermarkets, uh, places that can gather large numbers are also very important because the chance of over-insuring somebody is very different than creating an over-indebtedness problem. And so providing the insurance through multiple channels or reaching people in places where they are ready to buy and interested to buy uh, is a good way of getting the insurance out. So it's not limited to so microfinance institutions or the key channel, but are not the only channel. I would like to ask you two questions. The first one is about the claims and how are you, how you can manage it financially and socially, because it's, it's a very big cost in insurance. And the second one is, you mentioned that in order to be sustainable microinsurance, it has to be a large number of microinsurance. But in many poor countries, people live very far away, and how you can do it? You, you can do it by cross association with some other crimes of the other markets. Thank you. Um, I'm, I may ask for a clarification on the second second part, but on, on, the, on the claims part, um, it can be a very big expense. This is why people start ordinarily with life insurance, because one tends only to die once, and so it's not a very high frequency, so it's a lower frequency type of a thing. But with higher frequency products, uh, meaning ones where there may be more events, 
the method that I have used is to uh, organize the services directly. And by organizing the services directly, this does a number of things. So think of a health maintenance organization or where somebody perhaps, if they have a, a house fire, perhaps they will um, bring building materials directly. And why is this important? Think, and I'm sorry, it's insurance, so, so it's, the examples are a little, can be a little gruesome. In an accidental dismemberment policy, this means where somebody's lost their, their hand in, in some sort of an, an horrible accident, let's say. Um, where there's a financial incentive, this can, in bad situations, cause people to, to take their own hand. And, and without disparaging the poor, because that's wrong. I think if I said there was an accident policy for $5 billion if you lost your pinky, there would be somebody within a mile of us who would lose their pinky. So it's if you put the financial uh, aspect to it, uh, 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 that doesn't quite work. So in terms of managing claims, if instead of delivering money directly, you deliver a prosthesis, this reduces the adverse, or reduces the moral hazard, because nobody's going to take their own hand in order to get a prosthesis. And it also can lower the cost, to your question. You can also lower the cost of resolving the problem, because the insurer essentially becomes the largest purchaser of prostheses, buys them at a much lower price than any individual purchaser could buy them at, and provides the service. Now, the second part of your question, I think, was about um, helping people in difficult locations. And that same, that same thing applies. This is about access. And so when I was working in Brazil, we were providing services to households. And in some of the favelas, the policemen, at the, in the late 90s, police couldn't go into some of these favelas. It wasn't until the mid-2000s that, that there was the pacification or whatever that they went and moved the army in. Um, but we had agents going into these neighborhoods because we were ready to pay the agents if they would serve our customers. And our customers lived in those neighborhoods. And the same went to Casas Bahia, this major retailer that, that I showed with the dental uh, policy. They've always had trucks going into the most difficult neighborhoods in Brazil because there was a financial will. There was a reason for them to do it, and they found a way. So through this economic action, through this uh, actually creation of services directly by the insurer or through the insurance policy, uh, this can go a long way to, to getting help. And we, we worked not only, in the, um, not only in the favelas, we had people on boats going up the Amazon to deliver new refrigerators to people. It was, it was quite remarkable that, that once, uh, once an organization has the scale to provide the services, um, it, it, it makes those, kind of, uh, 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 those types of transactions possible. Some more questions? In order to set up uh, a good working insurance scheme, you need to be able to determine a correct premium. <laughs> determine a correct premium means that you need statistical information, you need damage claim information, you need a lot of information. And I can imagine that in, in the circumstances here where certain insurance products are offered uh, to the people, that, that that information is just not available. So I'm, I'm just wondering if that does not create the risk that schemes or insurance policies are setting up, which in the end will lead to sort of a bankrupt uh, situation. Um, yeah, the data availability is much lower in these situations. Uh, in some cases, there's no alternative but to go out and try it. Um, I, I don't see as an alternative waiting for the information to be perfect or available, which is the position that a lot of insurers seem to take, which is, well, once the data is available, we'll go and insure. The data is never available if you don't go and insure, because part of this is, in fact, who has bought the insurance is going to affect what the real numbers are. So this then comes back to the importance of doing these as regulated schemes. Uh, and the importance of, of uh, helping supervisors to be ready to support the types of institutions that are going out and, and doing the work. Because um, with the profligation, with many smaller insurers out there that, that perhaps won't um, have the skills necessary, there's a chance that they will go bankrupt. But without having the competition of many smaller insurers, there's a chance that the larger insurers won't 
do enough to go and, and be active. So it's, it's a fine balance. The question of data, um, fortunately, is also being solved by, um, uh, uh, by, by mobile phones. I like to think of, in the year 2000, perhaps 85% of the planet was in virtual darkness, data-wise. No mobile phones, no credit cards, no internet. And just in 10 years, that proportion has reversed, where 85% of the world's population is holding a mobile phone, is using some sort of a, a, a SIM card to do transactions or, or whatnot. And the data avail availability now is much better. We just haven't gotten to fully understand it yet. We haven't gotten to fully collect that data and use it yet. But there are, are tremendously interesting examples. I, I mentioned rainfall uh, insurance before. Uh, the typical way to collect rainfall data is to have a weather station which will sit somewhere and, and when it rains, it collects it and there's a little wind thing to measure how windy it is and what have you. And they cost about $800 per station. It's expensive to put them everywhere. There are researchers at the ETH in Switzerland looking at a completely different uh, problem. In fact, they were looking at flooding in Switzerland um, and they found that the interference between two mobile phone antennas that have a microwave that go in between you could measure reliably the size of the raindrops that are going in between these two antennas. So instead of putting these weather stations everywhere, one can use what is effectively static and junk data to the cell phone companies, who are, this is annoying to them. They don't want to have uh, their micro, microwaves interrupted. But for the insurer, we go, aha, wait a minute. Now we can take something that is junk to somebody else and turn it into a golden opportunity to serve new, new clients. So I think the data availability uh, one, by people just being bold, taking a risk. The ones that have the ability to take the risk ought to take it. Um, you know, that's the first. Uh, and, and then the second, through, through, through mobile phones and other data sources, uh, this is going to improve naturally uh, and, and quickly at that. Uh, my name is Pierre Chapuzet. Uh, I have one question uh, regarding uh, natural, uh, small or bigger disasters. So if you, for example, take a region when you manage to insure all the farmers and uh, there's not so many diversification in their activity, let's say they are um, growing, I don't know, what kind of fruit or, or cows, for example, and then there's a disease. And I think in these kind of countries, it is something that can happen uh, easily. I mean, if one of your clients is affected, you may have uh, many of your clients affected at the same time. So my question is for your portfolio as an insurance company. How can you manage it uh, if you, for example, don't have a geographical diversification? Um, so, so there's a function within the insurance industry, which is the reinsurance layer. So insurance companies will buy reinsurance from typically a global reinsurer, which is really specialized in capital uh, uh, optimization and are ready to take these risks. In fact, reinsurers are very happy to take a lot of diverse risks because that's, that's their job, is to pull all of that stuff up into the meso layer uh, and, and do it there. And a, a great number of insurers are very, or reinsurers are very active now and looking for risks because they, they find it interesting, the, uh, you know, uncorrelated to their, their, their core stuff, or in fact, uh, negatively correlated risks, such as the El Nino risk, in Peru, which causes flooding for people in Peru and Ecuador, actually means that there is a lower chance of hurricanes hitting the Gulf Coast. So it's, it's a wonderful thing to insure as a reinsurer because then you're, you're, you're going to, in a, a year where you're not going to be hit in the Gulf Coast, yeah, you'll be hit in Peru, but vice versa, and these can offset, and that's, that, that's the reinsurance market. Yes, hello, my name is Uli Gerard. Um, I have a little question on the health insurance. Um, it's good to insure, but what about uh, the quality of um, the, the health service? Because if you insure a health service that's not qualitative, so yeah. do you also pay attention to that? It, it's, it, it's, uh, let's call it a virtuous circle, because the same goes. You improve the health services by funding it through philanthropical donations or through the World Bank or whoever, 
uh, and then if there's no insurance mechanism in order to ensure the financing of that improved health service and the use of that health service, then it's, it's, it's also no good. Um, the introduction of health insurance in India, I was visiting in Uttar Pradesh in the RSBY program and speaking to the, they very proudly, you know, we're bureaucrats and we're very happy about what we do here and, and India is marvelous that way and, and, and they were talking about their program. And my one question to them is, what has this done to your facilities? And they said, well, we're so happy that you asked because uh, we had, uh, I'm gonna have to make up the numbers, we had 20 hospitals uh, and they were at 70% capacity and now we've just built 10 new hospitals and they're all running at, at a very high capacity and we had, uh, you know, uh, 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 you know, some certain number of chemotherapy stations and radiology stations, and now we've doubled that. And it isn't that more people are getting cancer. The same number of people, uh, I mean, that's, that's, that's a perfectly random event, sadly. Um, well, and, 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 you know, of course, there's some external causes. But um, uh, people aren't getting cancer because now they have health insurance. They're visiting hospitals because they have health insurance. And then the hospitals are being used because there's health insurance. So the quality, of course, is important. But without an ability to fund that kind of work at all, it's very hard to improve the quality, and it's certainly very, very hard to uh, sustain the quality. Um, health, is a, health is a big frontier. It's a tricky product, of course. Um, it is a, I said people die once, but they get sick often, so uh, it's high frequency, and, and um, uh, I think that's, that's an area where we're gonna be working on for a long time. Thank you. So, ladies and gentlemen, I have the pleasure of making some closing remarks to this already seventh edition of the Microfinance Lunch Break, which today dealt with the subject of microinsurance distribution approaches to reach the poor. Mr. Brandon Matthews, an eminent specialist on microinsurance, led us to a series of items. Working poor indeed live with substantial risk and face devastating circumstances when those risks become reality. We learned that global insurance markets have ample capital, both financial and intellectual, to ultimately insure the assets and income of the working poor. Nonetheless, demand and supply are not, or not always, adequately aligned. Nevertheless, the positive role of microinsurance services to alleviate poverty can't be denied. Increasingly, new methods of distributing and offering insurance are proving successful. Today, Mr. Matthews gave us a humanizing insight into the economic lives of the global poor and a valuable resource for attempting to improve those lives, especially through microinsurance services. As a very experienced watcher and player in the world of microinsurance, Mr. Matthews gave us a bird's eye view on several key issues dealing with microinsurance, especially how insurance distribution should reach the poor. Gaining access to microinsurance indeed is a key issue to make microinsurance successful and to reach huge numbers of families who most need appropriate insurance. I'm sure that he left us with a lot of food for thought. The aim of the microinsurance lunch breaks is to raise the awareness and to increase the interest of the challenging world of microfinance and microinsurance. Today, we went already through the seventh edition and as a result of you can state, there is an increasing interest for the subject. As promised, we will continue to alternate the subject between microfinance and microinsurance. I can confirm you that the next microfinance lunch break is scheduled for February 2013. So, many thanks to Mr. Brandon Matthews for his clear and concise introduction today. Thanks to all of you for your presence in large numbers. And this is a real encouragement for all those involved in the microfinance lunch breaks. And last but not least, many thanks to Mr. Thomas Leisen and KBC for their hospitality and the opportunity to gather there, here in their premises today. Finally, I have the pleasure to invite you all to the walking lunch, which for sure will give you the opportunity to meet and greet and exchange experiences and ideas. And I want to close with an example of successful cooperation because just before the microfinance lunch break, we had a press conference to announce that uh, in 14 African countries, 
uh, in West Africa, the microinsurance performance indicators, which have been developed by BRS together with ADA and with the support of KBC, now have been, it's, now have been uh, realized and also have been taken up in the, in the legislative framework for this country. So this means that the work that started in 2006 ended up in April 2012 with a successful implementation in the regulatory framework in those 14 West African countries. And I can uh, assure you this is a real form of cooperative success and BRS, ADA and KBC may be proud of it. Thank you.